it's fun to get a chance to talk a little bit and we're gonna my my goal today is really to get really get really practical as Howard alluded to but to answer his question about executive coaching so my my full-time responsibility is running a business which is probably true for many of you uh, we have a real estate investment and and development firm with a property management company work mostly in residential so we buy renovate build uh, and manage and then in the last couple of years I have I finally found a positive outlet for my obsession with learning about and thinking about productivity and making sure that I prioritize the things that matter most and working as a, as a part-time executive coach. Uh, and I was telling Oscar at the beginning, I have realized I absolutely love it. Getting the chance to come alongside a CEO or you know, a senior VP in a company and work with them one-on-one -on -one as they're grappling with all the different issues and dynamics. A lot of times in family businesses, which are consistently very challenging, uh, it's just a lot of fun. So that's, that's what I do in executive coaching. Did I do an adequate job of explaining that? I probably skipped right over a lot of details, but work, work, working one-on-one -on -one with executives, usually meeting two times, a week, uh, two times a month, just talking through the major wins and the major challenges they're dealing with in their business. And importantly, family life, which is a great segue to talk about why we're here, and, or particularly why, why I'm here and what I'm talking about today. So I want to start out with this paradox, the title on the screen, Accomplishing More by Doing Less. Now that sounds awesome. Where do I sign up? Uh, good news is there's only three small payments of $999. Now it, it sounds too good to be true, and it's a paradox. And that's part of what I'm going to do today is just challenge your thinking about what we mean by getting things done. Um, so let's start out with a, an example of productivity. Just imagine in your mind when we think about, when you think about who is the most productive person you know or that you know of, who comes to mind? Howard. Howard Graham. Okay, we've got to cast a wider net. Yes. Um, the, the folks that come to mind when I think about productivity a lot of times would be um, celebrities. You know, not all celebrities are productive, but Serena Williams is notoriously famous for being productive. Like, she has a very rigid schedule, working out tennis all morning, business meetings all afternoon, multi, you know, multi centimillionaire megastar. Um, Mark Wahlberg has like five or six children, uh, looks amazing, you know, like 2% body fat supposedly wakes up at 3.30 or 4 every day and works, does like a two or three hour workout twice a day. Um, I don't know about you, but I am not that committed um, to my body being a temple. Uh, I mean, just over the top. Um, one of, the, one of the, the things that I often, I, I always kind of come back to is the corporate world, right? Like sort of the celebrity CEO world. And you, you see these articles all the time in Forbes and other places where with CEOs who just work all the time. One of the folks I, I noticed this on last year during, during the, you know, everybody was talking about and writing articles about how your work life has changed with COVID uh, was Roz Brewer. And Roz was in the media, in the business media more recently when she became CEO of Walgreens. She's currently the only female African-American CEO in Fortune 500. But the article that I read last year was when she was a senior VP at Starbucks. And in this article, Roz talked about how COVID had been so great for her because she had finally was getting six hours a night of sleep. Prior to that, she was averaging five, working 12 hour days, seven, day, seven days a week, and just absolutely, uh, I, don't know, I don't know about bragging, but would everybody on Zoom just double check and make sure you're muted for us? Um, so I don't know about bragging, but it made, when I read that article, I thought, okay, this says a lot about our culture, that it's a badge of honor to talk about how you work seven days a week, right? Uh, and not only does it say a lot about our culture, but it says a lot about human nature and why we needed Yahweh to, to institute the Sabbath for our benefit. Um, so we live in this hyper-productive and hyper-productivity-focused culture. 
And on top of that, we live in the most distracted age and the most distracted moment in human history. Uh, we are constantly bombarded with information. I was reading this week that every single day, 86 million photos, 86 million photos are uploaded to Instagram. I, I'm not an Instagram user. I occasionally will, somebody will send me something to look at, but I can't even conceive of what are there 86 million pictures to take every day. Um, the one that really blew my mind though is that every day around the globe, one billion, that's with a B, one billion hours of YouTube content is, is watched. That's something like 120,000 years of videos get watched every single day around the world. So we have all of this content that's in all of this social media and that's to say nothing of all the little red dots the notifications that we get all day in our four five six seven eight different inboxes where it's just constantly coming at us and i just want to pause for a second and remind us highlight the distinction between what we are dealing with in terms of information coming at us and the demands and the temptation to be productive and how that juxtaposes against the very Word of God. Psalm 46, verse 10, starts out, Be still, and know that I am God. What's implied there is that we are not. When was the last time you just were still? Just contemplated your finiteness and God's infiniteness. I don't know about you, but I don't really have that built into my day. It's a, it's a, dis, it's a struggle, it's not even a discipline, it's a struggle to build that into the day. Centuries later, Jesus took this concept and made it an invitation, right? Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. The NIV says, I think, heavy laden, just weighed down like a beast of burden. Come to me and I will give you rest. Most days, this is just for me, but I've, I've noticed a lot of people resonate with this. Most days, I don't even think about my need for rest. But when I pause or reflect it's like, yeah, there, there is this heavy weight. There is this burden that I'm carrying around. All these demands. All of these things that I'm looking at. And so part of what we're going to talk about today is how do we create some distance from that? How do we take all of these values and core commitments, ideologies that, that Howard's walked us through, how do we apply that to the, the thick, the, the day in and day out aspects of our lives so that we are, we are not as burdened as we are able to take on Jesus' light yoke and experience freedom. So I've got three strategies we're going to talk through. And really, they're more tactics than they are strategies. They're part of, as Howard said, uh, strategy, or how did you say it? Strategies and tactics? You said it was great. For this. Just when you're in the intro. Um, it's a strategy to help us accomplish our strategies. Yeah, there you go. So it's tactics, but walk, walk through this with me. So the first thing is quit the treadmill. This is not an original illustration. You know where I'm going with the treadmill metaphor, but we're just running on it. I was thinking about this recently uh, on a Sunday morning, sitting in church, whole family, great sermon. I mean, super passionate. I mean, he was bringing it that day. And I look over and my nine-year-old is furiously taking notes and I'm thinking hey this is a big deal he's paying attention to the sermon like not only that he's writing it stuff down I gotta know what he's writing down so I look over and as soon as I do he covers his paper so we kind of play this game back and forth for a couple of minutes and I finally outsmarted him and acted like I wasn't paying attention and kind of rolled my eyes over to the side and while he was distracted on point number 15, he wrote down 15 different things. And I'm like, man, this is going to be awesome. And I look over and point number 15 was Nintendo Switch. Uh, that was not an illustration from the sermon. He was actually furiously building uh, in detail his birthday wish list. 
So, obviously a little disappointed. We've got some work to do at our house in terms of paying attention at church. Um, and I know I'm the only one in the room that deals with that, so y'all pray for me um, and my wife. At least you got there. <laughs> That's right. We got there. Coming in on three wheels, I promise. So, as I sat there and thought about his wish list, I thought, you know, that's just so me. Uh, I have infinite desires. You know, he had 14 things above the Nintendo Switch on the list that he wanted, and they were all even better and more expensive. I mean, he knew exactly what he wanted. And on the inside, I'm thinking, buddy, you got, a, you got another one coming, you got another thing coming. There is no way you're getting all that stuff on that list. Maybe two or three things. And by the way, your birthday is months away, <laughs> right? Now, I didn't say all that to him, but I was thinking on the inside, gosh, that's me. I want to, there are, there's a, I've got a list of 50 vacations I want to take, right? I've got a list of 20 friends I would love to go, not just have lunch with, but like go on, have like a weekend, you know, fishing trip just to catch up and do, do life. I've got all these experiences I want for my children, and every day they get closer and closer to leaving the nest, and it's like, I, there's not enough time. And so that's um, really what we're talking about with the treadmill, is just accepting the fact that there's not enough time, that we, that we have these infinite desires, but we are finite beings and can't do it all. And not only that, but I want to suggest to you that we harm ourselves when we try to do everything. Listen to this quote from Thomas Merton. To allow oneself to be carried away by a multitude of conflicting concerns, to surrender to too many demands, to commit oneself to too many projects, to want to help everyone in everything, is to succumb to give in to violence. That's a strong word. The frenzy of our activism, or we could say, we could substitute our busyness, neutralizes our work for peace. It destroys our own inner capacity for peace. It destroys the fruitfulness of our work because it kills the root of inner wisdom, which makes work fruitful. We could, I could even paraphrase this last part, basically saying that by willingly engaging in too much, we are snuffing out the work, the inner work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Consider similarly the words of Jesus and one of the New Testament's most famous busybodies and overachievers. Martha, Martha, you're anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Now, the thing that I love about this passage, the practical part of this passage is, as you all will know, it does not go on to say, don't ever worry about cleaning your kitchen or making a meal again. Just come to me and you won't ever have to worry or stress or do any work ever again, right? The work that we do is a part of our divine calling, a part of our being image bearers of God. But Jesus clearly calls us to release our anxiety. And so part of what we've got to do is just get off the treadmill. Releasing that anxiety is recognizing that God is in control and that we are finite and limited and can only do what we can only do. The second thing is to decide what is important. Now, I want to make the distinction between knowing something is important and making a decision. Knowledge implies understanding that we intellectually comprehend, yes, this is important. But a decision is an action verb. Right? You're doing something with that understanding. I'll give you an example from my own life. If you had asked me five years ago, what are the most important things to you in life? I would have given you a list, something like this slide. God's at the top of the priority list, closely followed by my family. And then there's my work, my calling, and then all the other commitments, something like that. But if you'd come alongside me and seen my, my, my day in and day out life, it would have looked something more like this where most of my waking time and some of my sleeping time was consumed with my work and other commitments. Right, just working too much, working too many hours, trying to do too many things, and then other commitments, really good commitments, like sitting on committees at church 
or nonprofit organizations that are doing really valuable work, right? And you want to give back. We've got to do that as well. So all of these commitments. And then I had to sort of shoehorn around that my other commitments, which usually meant that my wife was frustrated um, and I was coming in late or missing events, eating, you know, having to work at night, all those kinds of things. Now, hear me, there, there's no judgment in this. If any of that describes where you are in life right now, that's, that's okay. Um, but I want to challenge you. I mean, there's, and there's seasons where I still have to work. I, mean, I had to work last night. Um, it happens. But that's not the goal, right? We want to sort of relinquish or even walk away from the hustle fallacy, the idea that if we put in enough work, if we grind enough, if we just keep chipping away, we're going we're gonna to arrive and get there. Right, we, have to, we have to be really intentional as we get off the treadmill in deciding what's important. So juxtaposing these two things, this, this graphic is really helpful in terms of, now this does not mean, you see the, the work volume or the, the amount of time, if you think about each one of these items, the time sort of stays similar, right? The, the, the God triangle is similarly sized, right? I can't spend eight hours of my day just in devotion, right? I've, I have a calling in work, and so I have to go and provide for my family. But the, the sequencing of priorities is too, uh, for too many of us, ends up being out of sorts. <clears throat> there's, there's actually academic research that's been done on, on priorities and has consistently demonstrated that human beings are naturally inclined to prioritize things with a short deadline. So, you want to get a person to do something, you give them a deadline. You want to get someone to accept your offer to buy their house, you put it, make it expire tomorrow. Right? There's so many ways this is already built into the way that our society functions. The, the irony here is that the most important things in life rarely have a deadline. So if you had asked me five years ago about my children, I would have said, man, I love my kids. It's so important to me to invest in my kids. And we've got four. And so if you're with a big family, it's, it's hard to get one-on-one -on -one time with individual kids. And so I would have said, man, I love when I get one-on-one -on -one time with my kids. It's, it's really hard to do, but I, it's so important because I want to have a relationship with each kid. But if you looked at my schedule or the way that I spent my time, it rarely reflected that value. So again, that's the distinction between I knew what was important but versus making a decision. And so back to that prioritization thing, there's no deadline attached to investing in your relationship with your spouse, investing in your relationship with God, investing in that one-on-one -on -one relationship with a child. Annie Dillard illustrates this so simplistically, but I think this quote is beautiful. How we spend our days is, of course, how we spend our lives. What we do this hour and that one is what we are doing, right? So if our schedule is full of work and checking our phones and posting on Instagram, then that ultimately rolls up into how we spend our life. And so we already know, and I think a lot of what Howard taught on this year has helped with reminding us of what we are already committed to, what we know. But part of this, this tactic is just making a decision about what's important and how we're going to act. Making those decisions, I want to be clear on this, means that we're going to be, we have to say no to things. And this is really hard to do, right? We're constantly presented with infinite options, right? This conference, this Zoom call, this meeting, this opportunity, it's, can't do it all. It, it almost feels in our day and age like it, we ought to be able to do it all, right? I, I don't know about you, but I actually operate often from this, uh, this assumption. Almost, I'm almost surprised that I can't get everything done that I want to do. There's this infinite desire to do things. I want to I visit with every friend. I want to say yes to every lunch request that I get. I want to work with every client that expresses an interest. I want to buy every property that pencils out and looks good as an investment, and on and on and on. But this decision starts with just got to say no. Howard and I were talking this morning about this, that in the last year, the, the popularity of Zoom has actually made saying no even more important, 
right? You don't even have to get in your car to go to a meeting anymore, 90% of the time. So there's even less friction between an, another meeting. So if you're not careful, your calendar can just be all day back to back to back Zoom meetings. And so cultivating the discipline of saying no becomes all the more important. This decision about what's most important means having to say no to other things. So let's get into some practical tactics around this. And that's the third thing. So quit the treadmill, decide what's important, and then commit your calendar. Now, I'll just start with the calendar by saying that I think the primary, I think the calendar in this day and age for the, a business, a work environment, um, unless you're in education or something like that where your calendar is 100% dictated or 95% dictated to you, the calendar is the single most effective tool in, pro in prioritizing and making sure that you're working on the things that matter most, that are the most important to you. So, in order, uh, to illustrate that, this Michael Hyatt quote, that which gets scheduled gets done. You may have heard of the 1950s, 1960s management maxim is that which, that which gets measured gets done, right? When key performance indicators became popular in the corporate world, the idea was to measure everything and as a result of reporting on dashboards of all the things we're measuring, we're encouraging those things to get done. Well, Michael kind of put a little twist on it and said, the things that get scheduled get done. Um, and I, I just think starting from here, um, starting from that assumption is so valuable. So for example, to go back to my, my desire to invest in my children one-on-one, -on -one, I knew that that, that that time with them was important but the way that I spent my time, the way that I allocated my finite resource in my calendar did not reflect that. And so in the last year, I put my money where my mouth is. It occurred to me, you know, I've got four kids. Generally speaking, there's, there's four Tuesdays every month. Why don't I just take a different kid to breakfast every day? Um, and so we started doing that. I put it on the calendar. Not only that, I, com I, committed, I committed it, communicated it, both of those things to my children. And so all of a sudden, I had a commitment that I had to fulfill. It became urgent. You know, now that it's on the calendar every Tuesday, there's a deadline. And lo and behold, wouldn't you know it, I got some reward, some payoff in the process. So not only is it on the calendar, but it's actually a real event in my life. Um, I got a little bit of trouble, uh, as you can see from the photo. Not only did we have a very sugar-filled breakfast yesterday uh, with, a, with a side of bacon, but it, uh, the picture looks like my daughter drank a very large beer for breakfast. Uh, um, I assure you that was apple juice, um, and though I did not get a call from her teacher, I'm sure she was a handful after all the sugar she had. But more importantly, we build this time into the calendar. And right, everybody's season of life, everybody's personal story is different. Not everybody has four kids. Not everybody has kids. I'm, I'm just saying this is an, a personal example that illustrates how making a decision and then using the calendar can change the outcomes, can get us more of the types of outcomes that we want. So the second thing, so putting things in the calendar is one. The second thing is utilizing an uh, ideal week. Now let me let me pause here and say, I think the the multi colors uh, in the calendar and a very very full calendar uh, caused some anxiety when we started talking about this this morning. So let me give a little bit of background context. This is a uh, this is a hypothetical calendar. This is not an actual calendar. And if the color coding bothers you, at least on Zoom, you can turn to grayscale for a minute. But what I want to talk through is this is an ideal week, right? So this is not my actual week, but each one of us has a rhythm that's built in to our job or to our business. And most of us are generally pretty reactive throughout the week, right? We get calls all the time from clients, from employees, from bosses, asking us to come to a meeting, asking us to take care of this. And so we're constantly in reactive mode. The, going through the exercise of creating your ideal week is intended to be proactive, where you're trying to say, okay, if I, I did not have to um, respond to requests or directives, 
then this is what my week would look like. So I'm just going to walk through a couple of examples to help clear, uh, illustrate this. So if you look at my Monday, there at the top, 7.30 every Monday morning, I've got a, a meeting with our maintenance team to get everybody squared away and kicked off for the week. I've got a 9 o'clock Zoom meeting every Monday to kick off the week for the rest of the team. I meet with a direct report, 1.30, that's the yellow box sort of towards the end of the day. And then at, at 4.15, I have a meeting every Monday with a business partner. So I kind of know, my, I've got my Monday structured where I've got these same recurring rhythms. And as a result, I can look at this proactively and say, okay, where do I have time to, act, to get actual work done, right, as opposed to meetings? Um, I'm not in the corporate world, and so I'm not in as many meetings, but all of us struggle, mo almost all of us struggle with this meeting paradigm of just constantly being meetings and in meetings and not having enough time to sit down and get work done, right? Part of the way that I've addressed that in my ideal week is I've blocked every single Tuesday for no, that's a no meeting day. So this helps me have accountability. It also gives my assistant, when she's scheduling meetings and calls, a framework. She knows she's not going to schedule anything on a Tuesday unless I absolutely insist on it. Tuesdays get set aside instead for me to do deep work and particularly to focus on quarterly goals. So remember what I said, the things that are most important, ironically, are often, not, don't, often don't have a deadline attached to them. I find the same thing is true even with goals within the business. That if we set a goal for a quarter or for the year, it doesn't have that immediate deadline the way that you know a closing tomorrow might or a financing a refinance that you're trying to we're trying to get done by the end of the month so setting aside every time every week to work just on those quarterly goals becomes incredibly valuable because all of a sudden I'm not in meetings and I have the ability to do that that wouldn't be possible if I hadn't identified and blocked that on the calendar and then implied in that is said no to things and that's probably the hardest part of it, of all of this, is having to say no to things that you want to say yes to. So that's just a couple of examples from the ideal week. But the idea is to get clear about what is most important, what the priorities are, before you get into the week, and then reschedule accordingly. Now, again, this is just ideal. I have an actual calendar that looks totally different from this. But usually, we're try I'm trying to match things up to create space. How does this apply to my to-do list? Well, I know if I've got 14 things on my to-do list and it's Wednesday, or sorry, Thursday, then I know I've only got from 2 to 5.30 that day to work on those 14 things, which means I'm not going to get all those 14 things done. It's just not going to happen. Going back to where we started, we have this infinite desire. We have these sometimes seemingly infinite to-do lists. And the reminder from God is that He is the one who is infinite. We are finite and cannot do it all. And so just being reminded, I can't get all this done. I only have these, th th these hours in the day. Um, is, is really the starting point of clarity. So accomplishing more doesn't necessarily mean doing more. It just means accomplishing the things that matter most and saying no to the things that don't matter as much. Um, some of you may have heard of Parkinson's Law, the idea that the amount of time it takes to get something done uh, is directly correlated to the amount of time available to do it. An example I use a lot for this is when I was in college, I'd have a term paper, I knew I had all semester to do it. And if I had just blocked every Thursday at one o'clock, for one hour to work on it, would have gotten the thing done by fall break. But it would have, I would have spent you know, over 18 weeks, I would have spent 18 hours on it. Surprisingly, uh, you get to the night before it's due, and I allot 2, 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. to get it done. I've only got two hours, and lo and behold, I still get a term paper due because I procrastinated and waited to the end of the semester. So same term paper, maybe not the same product, but could have been done in 18 hours, could have been done in two. The same thing applies to everything that we do, right? If you've only got four minutes to send an email, then you'll get that, but you've got to get it sent off, you will. If you've got 25 minutes to think and wordsmith and write it exactly the way you want because you want to make the right impression, then you'll spend that time. So again, putting these constraints on ourselves with the calendar makes 
<clears throat> accomplishing the things that are most important, more feasible. And then the last thing is a weekly review. Uh, if you're on the email list, then you got the article that went out yesterday uh, that I wrote kind of walking through the reasons why, the strategy for doing a weekly review. Uh, what I thought I'd talk about just briefly is, are some of the things that I do within my weekly review every week. And I, I really think that going through this process, and for me it's every Friday afternoon, some people do it Monday morning, some people do it on Saturday morning, but going through the process every week without fail, as, unless, I, unless I fail and I can't, sets me up for success every week. So what I do, you got kind of four different categories in these 10 things, and I won't talk, touch on all of them. But I go through, I actually use a physical planner. The FFP is the full focus planner. That's the planner that I use. But I go through that and go through all of my notes from the week, identifying things where I need to follow up, ta create new tasks for myself the following week, things that I need to move over into my project management software that we use. And then I go through, there's a weekly review process that's actually built into the planner that I use. And the thing that I love about that is it holds me accountable to think through what were my big wins for the week. Um, I have noticed this about myself time and again. I've noticed this about all the high achievers that I work with in coaching is that we certainly high achievers and maybe most of us as Americans or even people just really struggle to celebrate when we do something well, when we achieve a goal. Maybe I'm the only one in the room, but I can tell you when I, I set a big goal for myself and then I achieve it, it's like a 30 second celebration at best. And then I'm just on to what's the next goal? What's the next thing on my to-do list? And so going through this weekly review process holds, it just creates space, intentional space to do something that's important that doesn't have a deadline, which in this case is to celebrate what went well. And sometimes it may just be, hey, I had a great breakfast with my six-year-old. Other times it may be, we closed the biggest deal we've ever done this week. There's all kinds of things that could fit into that. But just celebrating what went well. You know, the, the, taking the rare moment to actually write an exclamation point on a piece of paper in celebration. And then going through and thinking about what are the things that I need to start saying no to? What are the things that I need to keep doing, improve on? Uh, K-I-S-S, keep doing, improve on, stop doing, and start doing. So that's more of a reflection time. Once I've done that, I go into my project management software and that's where I look at all the different open tasks that I'm connected to and try to follow up on as many things as I can. Um, the thing I mentioned there about rocks. Um, so this comes from Stephen Covey's idea of putting you know, the, the bucket, you wanna put the big rocks in first, the things that matter most. And so when we set quarterly goals, I make sure that I'm looking at those goals every week, even if I don't have a specific item that was due, there's not a deadline attached to those goals. I'm looking through all the goals that we've set once a week to make sure that we're taking the next right step towards those goals. So that we don't get to the end of the quarter and go, you know what, we were so busy, we just didn't have time to accomplish these goals this year or this quarter. And then the next thing is going back to the calendar. And so that's where ideal, meets with practical. Looking at, okay, do I have time set aside? I've got my weekly review scheduled for um, 9.30 on Fridays. Am I gonna be able to do that this week? Or do I have a conflict? I need to reschedule that to make sure that happens. You know, spending time with my kids on Tuesday mornings, making time to work out, take care of my body, help with stress, uh, making time to spend time in God's word. When, when is that gonna fit in to this this finite calendar that's super limited. So going through this process of looking through all the things on the calendar during that weekly review and making sure that the most important things get scheduled is a key component of making sure that the next week is a win and not just a tidal wave of overwhelm and um, feeling like I have, haven't, I've been unproductive. And then the last thing is I just set some priorities. So I try to use the same intentionality going into the weekend this is like a five minute exercise at best, but what are the things that, you know, family things that I need to get done? Are there bills that I need to pay? Are there um, games that we're going to? Just getting clear about what we've got going on for the weekend so that I can hopefully set aside Sunday as a day of rest, 
And then the last thing, and this along with the weekly review is sort of the secret weapon in my mind, is just deciding what are the three most important things that I've got to get done next week. And this is, this is really challenging, especially when you first start doing it. Because well, there's more than three things, okay, but there's three things that are the most important. So um, doing that, getting clear about what's the most important for the week, then can distill down into a, what's most important for Monday, what's most important for Tuesday, and so on. Setting priorities that are all derived from the bigger picture. So just to kind of review that before we get into some discussion, and I hope we have some, some good uh, questions or even pushback on these ideas, but just making a decision, acknowledging I am a finite human being and I'm, I'm going to stop trying to do everything. I'm going to make a decision from that. I'm going to make decisions about what's most important in these different domains, family, personal life, work, and then I'm going to commit my calendar to do the most important things first, or at least make sure that they get scheduled. It may only be you know, five, out, five minutes a day, um, depending on our season of life dep and depending on what the commitment is, but getting those things built in the calendar and using that as a stake in the ground to hold ourselves, because so much of our work life is already attached to the calendar, using that as a stake in the ground to make sure these other important but non-urgent things get done. It's a great question. So one of the things that I didn't say is that this is all much easier said than it is done, especially if your calendar is, uh, has a lot of external demand on it, right? <clears throat> the ideal week is what it says it is. It's ideal. In reality, rarely lines up with the ideal. But if, if you are living mostly in a reactive way, um, and, I, and to your point about the term paper, like I, like my week this week is a mess. It's a hot mess because I overcommitted. Uh, I wanted to be here for as many of these teaching sessions as I could. I've got a, a big thing to prep for next week, and then I added in like three me three meetings this week that I shouldn't have. And so I am like a really divergent from the ideal right now. So it's it's a constant work in process. It's a it's it's We're sort. Right. Of, uh, <laughs> Uh, but it's, it's a constant work of, uh, in progress, just like being a follower of Jesus is, right? And the great thing is about a, a seven-day rhythm is we get to start over on Monday. So hopefully next week, or realistically maybe the week after that, is going to look a lot closer to the ideal than it does this week. So there's lots and lots of grace for that. And this is not, I mean, so Michael Hyatt, the guy that I quoted earlier, I do some, uh, some coaching work with their organization and Michael's been my coach for the last three years. And I was so resistant to working with him as a coach for several years because I thought this guy has got everything planned out. He has like a weekend optimizer that he fills out on Fridays. Like I, I need somebody who's more like a mess like I am. And so if that doesn't, that probably didn't come through in my comments, but I mean, I'm, I'm a scattered mess a lot. And so what I had, while I have resisted the calendar for years, cause I didn't want to be all those constraints put on me. What I have found is actually freedom within that because all of a sudden I'm starting to do the things that really matter more, most rather than just reacting all the time. So just to go back and give you a specific example of where you could start. When I put, when I take my ideal week and I have these meetings, so if you went and looked at my actual calendar, these boxes in yellow are on my calendar because those are recurring meetings or calls, okay? The weekly review up there and the coaching calls, those are blocked on my calendar. So if I got a meeting request from Howard to meet on, on Friday at 9.30, I would be in a position to say, Howard, I'm sorry, man, I would love to get with you, but I've already got another commitment at that time. So. The calendar actually becomes a tool and we can, you know, um, and, and depending on who it is, you can decide how much transparent, how transparent you want to be in terms of what that commitment is. But you can say with integrity, I've got something else that I'm committed to at that time, so I'm not available to meet. Um, but blocking time to make sure that the things that matter most get done is a great place to start. And I would even say a step before that is just getting clear on what the commitments are, right? Um, and especially there's several in here that have wide open calendar for the clients, you know, to be reactive, to 
transaction calls and things like that. So you that's make right. big, but to insert the big stuff that you want to get done in the other boxes. Yeah. Just, you know, if you've got a lot, if you've got a wide open calendar, but you have clients that are constantly calling or may, may or may not call, then I think, one, you got to block time on your calendar for the meetings that you know you have to be into, like a weekly sales meeting or production meetings or whatever they are, and then blocking other time on the calendar. Say, okay, well, I know on Mondays I've got these two meetings. I got to block the rest of the day so that I can either A, get work done, or B, respond to clients as they call, depending on what, you know, what the, what that week and that client's demands are. Um, I think a helpful, a helpful exercise also that I would add is just taking a day, putting a day on the calendar, uh, let everybody know that you're, you know, you're off, you're not available, so there's not an expectation of response. And whether you, you know, rent a hotel room or go out, of, you know, go out of town for the for a night, but just sit down and outline every domain of your life. Right? There's somewhere between seven and twelve life domains. Right? Um, Spouse, kids, other family, um, hobbies, work, on and on, health, body, those kinds of things. And just assess for yourself, how do I feel about each one of those accounts, each one of those domains? Am I on a scale of one to 10? Or am I wealthy or am I poor? You know, there's all kinds of different spectrums you can consider, but just sort of assess each one of those. And then once you've gone through and done the assessment, then ask the question, what would have to be true in order for me to move from a body that's in poverty to a body that's wealthy, right? Have like Parker Tennant biceps. What would it require for me to get to that point? That's right. Marky Mark. <laughs> uh, that's right. It's on the calendar. But asking yourself what would have to change, what would have to be true in each one of those domains can also be a great place to start. Um, because then from that comes goals, right? What are your desires? Which can then turn into goals or commitments that you have things that you want to put on the calendar. So you got to know about what you want in order to, to put it on the calendar. And once a quarter, which you said. Right? Yeah, and then the rhythm for me is once, once you do that one time, then what I would suggest is every quarter scheduling a day to do that to review. Hey, how did I, how did I, go, did I move from a seven to an eight? Or did I move from a six to a four, right? Um, I, we were, you know, personal finance is one that f the clients almost always rank the lowest, right? Did we move, we were six and we're trying to do better saving money and we moved to a seven or no, we, we had this come up and now we're back at a four and I'm feeling really frustrated. But just being aware of these things, taking a day to check in on each one of these domains of life and think about what you want and what your, what your desires are is a great place to start. Yeah, so the reason the weekly review is so important is most of us are, are just going about our day-to-day -day work life and our day-to-day -day life period just uh, sort of following whatever's in front of us, right? I won't say like lemmings, I don't mean it that drastically, but you know, if a calendar's on the meeting, we just go to the, I'm sorry, for the meetings on the calendar, we just go to the meeting, right? If, if somebody asks us to come to a, a meeting at church, uh, or the nonprofit that we sit on, like we just go. Yeah, you know, we just put it on the calendar. Taking the time every week to zoom out is a, is sort of a pause from the busyness at at ground level. And zoom out, you know, ten thousand feet, and say, what are my priorities? That's the thing that I think is missing from so many people, including my own uh, normal routine or default routine, is not being clear about what our priorities are. Right, because remember the, the scientific re academic research, human beings prioritize things that have a deadline, but the things that are most important usually don't have a deadline. And so setting aside that time for a weekly review every week is a way to look at what's most important and then make sure that the deadlines we create for ourselves and the deadlines that we say yes to are the things that, that we want to do. That doesn't mean that we can all just have the perfect schedule, the perfect responsibilities. We have bosses or clients, sometimes employees who give us things to do that we'd rather not do. I don't mean that, but that we can prioritize accordingly and then know when we're, having to, when we're gonna have to make an exception or make a compromise, as opposed to just be constantly feeling behind um, and overwhelmed. 
you know, the, the challenge anytime, at least for me, anytime I'm teaching or presenting some content, is I want to be authoritative, but I, I'm really scared to sound, to, to, to go beyond authoritative to, to, to uh, suggest that I have mastery of the subject. I mean, that's why I shared like this week, scheduling wise, the calendar is just a hot mess for me. Um, we're constantly, you know, taking two steps forward, one step back. Some weeks for me are one step forward and two steps back. So I totally relate to that. Um, I think finding the right balance of self-imposed accountability um, and external accountability, whether it's, you know, with coworkers, spouse, friends, coaching, whatever, is really a challenge. It's a, and it's, it's constantly, and I, I can just say from my experience and observation with other people, everybody struggles with it. Some people are more self-disciplined, and so part of the accountability they need is like, hey, you need to chill out. You need to stop working at five o'clock every day because this whole working until eight o'clock every night isn't, isn't helping you meet your objectives in, these, in your life domain and some of these other domains. <clears throat> Father God, thank you for this time. Thank you for these men and women. Um, Lord, just ask uh, for wisdom, ask for uh, clarity and the ability to just make, to focus in on the things that matter most. Lord, you've given us the ability to do that. And we also thank you for the grace that uh, we're going to continue to fall short of the ideal, but keep on uh, working at it. And so, Lord, I pray that you would... Grant us, each one of us, these things. And we ask it all in the mighty and matchless name of your son, Jesus. Amen.